So good evening, everybody. Uh, hello and welcome to this Political Economy Research Centre uh, uh, event um, and to Goldsmiths. My name is Will Davis and I'm the director of the Political Economy Research Centre here at Goldsmiths. If you're interested in the centre, please visit www.perk.org.uk or follow us on, Gold, on Twitter at Goldperk or Facebook at Goldperk. Tonight, we are gathered here to celebrate the launch of a superb uh, new book, which is uh, Futilitarianism, Neoliberalism and the Production of Uselessness by Neil Vallely, which is published by Goldsmiths Press and I'm proud to say within the Perk series of the press, uh, of which I'm the editor. Uh, Neil first contacted me about this book about two years ago uh, to see if um, colleagues and I were interested in some of the themes of uh, the, these questions of uh, neoliberalism and the question of futility and of uselessness uh, to see if it was the kind of book that we were interested in. And I think it's actually uh, precisely the sort of topic and the approach to questions of capitalism, questions of political economy that uh, Perk uh, is concerned with that this book series uh, is all about. And I was absolutely delighted uh, to be able to see it through to its completion with Neil over the last couple of years. Um, it offers a sociological, cultural, political critique uh, of contemporary economic life and economic uh, regimes of government. Um, and I think it takes the kind of interdisciplinary uh, approach to neoliberalism, which joins the dots between different pathologies of contemporary uh, neoliberal life. Um, it traces questions of uh, futility and uselessness across various different dimensions of contemporary neoliberal society, including uh, the dysfunctions of the labor market, of consumption, of the ways in which we're trapped by digital platforms and some of the sense of foolishness that surrounds um, the efforts to manage things like the climate crisis through uh, merely appeals to personal choices and behaviours and this sort of thing. And the thread, as the title suggests, running through the book is the theme of uh, futility, uh, the sense that individual actions might have um, a, a, a rationality on a, on a basic instrumental utilitarian level, but which both individually and collectively uh, feel to us to be uh, futile in the sense that they don't seem to be delivering the forms of happiness, either individually or collectively, that utilitarianism as a philosophy is predicated on. Um, I'm delighted that Neil uh, is joining us tonight and he'll be able to discuss the book and take questions from you about the book. He's zooming uh, to us all the way from uh, New Zealand. Um, and we're also joined, I was actually saying earlier, I think this is our most intercontinental PERC event, uh, straddling uh, three different time zones around the world. We're also joined uh, by a, a terrific lineup of speakers, which is a, a testament to the quality of this book, uh, which are uh, Keir Milburn, um, who's in Leeds right now, uh, Lynn Segal uh, in London, uh, William Callison um, in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Unfortunately, Megan Day uh, is unable to join us this evening. Um, each of these different speakers has written about different aspects of the futilitarian condition in different ways, and I think we'll be able to bring different light uh, to some of the urgent questions that it uh, presents us with. Uh, the way I want to uh, run this is to invite each of the uh, three um, speakers to um, address some of the themes of Neil's book for about 10 minutes or so. We'll have to be quite strict on the time so that we can uh, get on to some of the discussion afterwards. Um, and then Neil's going to respond to some of the things that have been uh, raised about the book. Uh, hopefully we'll still have about 30 minutes at the end uh, to uh, take uh, Q&A from uh, people who are here with us this evening or this morning, depending on where you are. Um, and I'll probably what I'll do is ask people to put uh, those uh, comments and questions into the chat function. Uh, and then you can either unmute yourself and ask the question or I can read it out. Um, as uh, you may have noticed, uh, uh, we are recording the event this evening. Um, and uh, as long as nothing disastrous happens, hopefully we'll be able to put it out on YouTube, although my technological prowess so far uh, doesn't fill us with confidence, uh, put it out on YouTube. Um, so obviously keep that in mind if you just, whether or not you decide you want to ask your question on and, and, and how, you want to, how you want to frame it. Um, I'm gonna go through each of the speakers in turn. I wanna start uh, by introducing Keir Milburn, who is a writer, researcher, and educator. Uh, he's recently escaped from academia and is now working on municipalism, economic democracy, and political economy for the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in Germany. He's also a research associate of the think tank Commonwealth with whom he develops and implements public common partnerships, uh, which is an alternative model for the ownership and governance of assets. His most recent book, Generation Left, which is a terrific read, addresses generational political divides driven in part by generational imbalances in asset ownership. And he's also the co-host of the ACFM podcast on Navarra Media. So Keir, uh, over to you. 
Thanks, Will. Um, yeah, and thanks, Neil, as well. And thanks, thanks for inviting me to um, uh, to take part in the launch. I, I, I read the book. I really enjoyed the book, and in fact, I you know I found it really timely. Right, and part of the part of the reason that it felt timely was uh, because futility and therefore futilitarianism. I think we can all agree captures something about the the present, right? About we could put it this way: the the, the contemporary structure of feeling. And I think um, it's the timeliness that I want to take seriously in my little contribution. Um, I mean, whenever whenever we read a, a read something, a book or, or or an article, we 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 usually read it through the lens or the problems that we're trying to think through at the time. Unfortunately, Neil, this is what I'm going to do. What else? What else can I do? Um, but I want to sort of read it through those sort that sort of lens, which will be a bit of a generational lens. Uh, and then come to the question of like what is to be done about futilitarianism because I think that's the real challenge that the that 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 basing a, a a concept around the concept of futility like the leap towards well what do you do about that is a difficult one I think and I want to try and get to that uh, in a moment um and I think I think actually thinking about it the timeliness of of the concept of futility futilitarianism can help us get to that what is to be done so I'll sort of work through that a little bit I think so, so futilitarianism is, um, I, I, I took it as, as an attempt to name the post 2008 iteration of neoliberalism, right? And there's been other attempts to try to capture what that post 2008 version of neoliberalism is. Uh, in fact, Will Davis uh, suggested um, punitive neoliberalism as, as a way we could capture, uh, capture what's changed uh, post the 2008 financial crisis. Um, I and other people have sort of suggested uh, zombie neoliberalism uh, as a way that we might be able to capture what changed. That's gone out of favor a little bit, I think, zombie neoliberalism, uh, for slightly unfair reasons. I think. I think people sort of took zombie neoliberalism as, as the idea that perhaps neoliberalism is on its last legs. And so the fact that neoliberalism, neoliberalism has persisted means that the, the concept was wrong. But like, I, I don't think that's fair. Like, if you think about zombies, the thing about zombies isn't that they're just about to die, uh, they're already dead, <laughs> yet they persist, basically. They persist, uh, and what the, the difference between a, a living person and a zombie is, is that zombies persist without purpose, or about the ability to, to, to self-direct purpose, or to decide on a purpose for themselves, that's the bit that's missing. I'm sort of talking about George A. Romero versions of zombies, which is the canon, of course. <laughs> there are previous versions of zombies, but the George A. Romero version of zombies uh, you know, they act habitually, but they can't sort of think, they act without purpose. So I think that gets us somewhere close to what Neil is trying to capture with futilitarianism. And I think we could actually return to, to Will's suggestion of um, punitive neoliberalism, right? Um, so, so the idea that like, you know, perhaps what's, what captures the sort of structure of feeling of the time is this, is the attraction of witnessing the punishment of somebody else, basically. Right, look, we can all recognize that as well. And we can all recognize the sort of sense of futility. So how do we sort of resolve these two? And, you know, with a generational lens on, I'd probably want to say that like, that the, perhaps the, this urge to witness the punishment of others and, you know, the, the urge to escape a feeling of futility is probably, they're probably experiences that are distributed um, unevenly across, the, across different sectors of society. In fact, in the book, Neil gestures towards this probably more than gestures actually, he straight out says, look, this book is addressed to the, the generation of doomed youth, he says. So he's taken this generational um, uh, aspect on, on board, you know, um, and so I'd probably say something like the, the attraction of the punitive and the urge to escape the, the futile, perhaps they lay to one degree or another on either side of, of, a, of a generational political divide. The way, the way you might get into that is, is by, by looking at the aspect of utilitarians that, that is really quite key to Neil's argument, I think, in which he, he traces the human capital metaphor, basically. To capture the, 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 he, he traces the human capital metaphor, and in a way we could make it, we could gloss it like this. He says, you know, post-2008, we're still trapped in that human capital metaphor, um, and we're trapped within institutions which, which have been formed around that metaphor to try to make you to be obedient to that metaphor. So, you know, perhaps we're, we're still trapped within those, but the payoff, the payoff, the, the return on the investment in yourself has sort of collapsed. Uh, and that's why we get these feelings of futility, perhaps it's something like that. But futilitarianism names the, the sense of futility that comes from being forced to engage with institutions 
a, a, a perform a certain character, human capital, um, when the future that's attached to that obedience no longer seems believable, basically. And so the easiest way to understand that is something like universities, just because the returns on education, as, um, as the introduction of fees taught us to, to, um, to, to understand education, just because the returns on, edu educa on education, the returns on that investment in our human capital has collapsed, it's not, there's no easy way out of it, right? And there's no easy way out of, of the dominant forms of managerialism, right? Which also force you to conform to the, that form of, 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 um, of, of, of that metaphor of human capital. And so what, what comes up, this, this, this feeling of being trapped in these institutions, being forced to perform something, but not believing that, that, that we will get the return on our investment, I think that, it, you know, that produces a feeling of, of futility and, and a sort of crisis of meaning, uh, I think. I'm not doing full justice to Neil's argument, but that's one, that's definitely one aspect of what he means by, by futilitarianism, I think. Well, he can come back and say that, can't he? But what I'd want to add to that is, um, is, that, is that, 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 that the neoliberal institutional reform around the human capital metaphor, which Foucault tries to get at for this idea of um, neoliberal governmentality, I'd say, look, that's only one of the asset logics. I think that's an asset logic to, to assume the logic of, of an asset. But that's only one of the, the asset logics that are informing what we'd call political subjectivation, which just means the, the way in which uh, uh, th those sort of logics get embedded in your head and they give you affordances, which may make you more likely to, 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 to understand the world and how you relate to people in a particular way or not. There's, there, there are a couple of different asset logics which inform political subjectivation in the neoliberal era, right? That human capital metaphor is certainly one of them. The other one is just asset ownership, right? And that's not, that's not gonna be a surprise to anybody. The sale of council housing in the 1980s, that was specifically in order to do, perform political subjectivation to produce new conservative voters, encourage people to think of themselves as asset owners rather than workers, right? Um, so let's update, if you wanted to update that, we'd probably say something like this, right? Asset ownership tends to produce rentier subjectivities, right? And human capital metaphor tends to produce entrepreneurial subjectivities. That's what Foucault says about it, you know, entrepreneurs of ourselves is the outcome of, of this sort of human capital metaphor. Uh, and so by, by, by setting it up that way, I'd want to make this other argument is that perhaps what we've been witnessing since 2008 is something that Thomas Piketty sort of catches in that um, Capital in the 21st Century, his, his book from um, seven years ago, probably seems like that now, you know, he, he makes this argument that, look, one of the tendencies in capitalism is for rentierism to eat entrepreneurship, in a way. He, says, he does this thing, he says, the past tends to devour the future. Uh, the entrepreneur inevitably tends to become a rentier, uh, become uh, more and more dominant over those who own nothing but their labour. Um, so I could take that argument a little bit further and say, look, perhaps the punitive aspects of of the current conjuncture, which, which Will Davis sort of uh, gestures to, or more than gestures, keep using that word, Will Davis um, uh, support, pr pr proposes is the, is the way to capture the structure of feeling. Perhaps that, the attraction of that punitive aspect is, is perhaps linked to the sort of insecurities that come with a rentier subjectivity, right? Where, you, where you're quite desperate actually to, to, to find some sort of legitimation for your position and your income and, you know, uh, punishing others is one way to address that. Uh, so that's one of the asset logics and perhaps the other asset logic, futilitarianism, names that futility that comes with being trapped in a world of work and social reproduction based around this human capital metaphor, which is collapsing basically. And of course, there's a sort of age, age aspect to that because the asset ownership is massively divided by, by uh, generationally. There we are. Neil and Will, you're both right. That's brilliant. We're all happy. Um, but um, if, we, if we're trying to name a, a, or capture a structure of feeling, that doesn't resolve the thing. The, when, the, the thing you'd have to then, then do is to think about, well, which structure of feeling is, is residual, which one is dominant, uh, and which one is emergent? Which, that's what Raymond William, who, who came up with the idea of structures of feeling, that's what he suggests is there's always an emergent, uh, a dominant, and a residual one. You know, if you'd asked me that question in 2018, early 2018, I'd be really sure which was the emergent um, and which was the dominant. And it's much harder to uh, harder to say now, I think. 
And I think that points to another aspect of, 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 of Neil's concept of utilitarianism, which is it also names something else. It also names this absent of a viable and strategic left project, basically. Whether, whether Corbynism and Saundersism was a viable and strategic left project, that's still, we, we, I, I can't answer that question here and now, but it certainly seemed a lot more like it in, two, in 2018. Um, so then it's like, what is the what is to be done question about that? Right. Um, how do you start from from what, what Neil suggests is a common experience of futility? And I'd say it is perhaps, you know, among certain sectors of, of, of the society. You know, how do you move from the from recognizing a common experience of futility and move towards a viable left project which can overcome that futility? Um, and if I've got time, have I got time, Will? Uh, maybe a minute or minute or two. Right, I'll just do this really quickly. <laughs> Um, I want to just point to another another uh, article, which which um, also sort of tried to periodize capitalism through 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 structures of feeling, or what they call dominant passive effect. And it's a, it's a 2014 short article. We are all called "We are all very anxious," and it just says, along with every sort of periodization of capital, goes a, a, goes a passive a dominant passive affect. Right? It's quite a simple sort of. So early capitalism is dominated by misery. The early workers' movement are machines for fighting misery. The Fordist period, Keynesianism, the dominant affect is boredom, and a lot of the techniques of the 60s and 70s, counterculture, et cetera, are machines for fighting boredom. Now the dominant aff affect is anxiety, which Neil talks about as well in the book. And, he, and so the, 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 the solution offered in this article is, you know, we need machines for fighting anxiety as a precondition for collective action. And he suggests consciousness raising groups. And in fact, this article was the ultimate source of why Mark Fisher then went on to be really concerned with consciousness inflation uh, in his book, Acid Communism. And so what, I said, what I'm sort of suggesting, I think, is that something that looks like consciousness raising practices probably are the precondition to escape of utilitarianism or, or futility. Like, so you basically recognize the common shared condition of futility, then you recognize the techniques and the uh, the, the technologies which are creating this sense of utility, which is what Neil starts to do in the book, or what he does do in the book, um, and you know, then then that allows us to sort of to to, to realize it's not that that it's not the futility is not something that emerges from inside us, but it's something that is structural, and you therefore you address the structural thing. The problem, which perhaps Neil can address, is that there's another leap, isn't there, with utility? Is that you also need to get some sort of sense of confidence um, that. Um, that, that meaningful change is possible. I don't know how to make that leap, but I think just as a final, final point, I think one of the really interesting contributions in Neil's book is that he raises this, this concept of semi-indigestibility, -ind which is this idea that we cannot, that the pace of, of, the, of, of information means that we cannot, um, we can't digest things basically. We can't digest the information and arguments that we're presented with. So one part of what we need to do is to find institutional structures which slows things down uh, to the level at which we can deliberate together. That's my only suggestion of an answer. Great, thanks so much, Keir, uh, that's terrific. Um, we're gonna move on because there's plenty of, you raised lots of issues here to do with um, affect, to do with asset ownership, different periodizations of neoliberalism and so on. So there's a lot there to, to chew on and for Neil to come back on some of that. But, um, First of all, we're going to move straight on to Lynn Segal, uh, who is Emeritus Anniversary Professor at Birkbeck University of London in Psychosocial Studies uh, and has been a socialist feminist activist, teacher and writer since the 1970s. She has published widely on feminism, gender, ageing and political activism. Her most recent books, Making Trouble, Life and Politics, Out of Time, The Pleasures and Perils of Ageing, Radical Happiness, Moments of Collective Joy. And as part of the Care Collective, she co-authored the Care Manifesto, The Politics of Interdependence, which came out uh, during the pandemic, I believe. Uh, she is currently writing Lean on Me, Disavowals of Dependency. So I'd like to invite Lynn to offer some remarks about the book. I also want to apologize to Lynn for leaving her stranded in a different Zoom call. <laughs> Hello everybody, great to be here welcoming Neil's book. And in all modesty, I have to say that quite unknown to any of you, I was an interesting choice to discuss it. And this is because once upon a time before any of you were born, I was briefly a futilitarian when entering adulthood in the early 1960s, or at least that's how I or we were seen. 
because I was then hobnobbing with those known as the Sydney Libertarians 60 years ago. But we were not critical futilitarians, but committed futilitarians, as one of our most vocal male members addressed us in a talk he gave in 1960, Futilitarianism and Libertarian Dilemma, later published in our broadsheet. For we were anarchists who believed in eternal conflict of interests and hence in notions of permanent revolution. Not that we did much about this, apart from discuss it in the pub, um, <clears throat> Uh, and sharing our disdain for all aspects of bourgeois culture and its um, <clears throat> demands for total conformity to all its social conventions in order to be accepted as good citizens. So we did know what we were against, which was just about everything which um, the state of things enshrined, and quite rightly so, I thought, in our deeply hypocritical conformist post-World War while my male comrades mostly refused all respectable jobs and tried to make a living through gambling or casual labor. But we were not at all clear about what we were for, apart from the next beer, or perhaps the next sexual coupling for again, very much at odds with the sexual double standards of the day, we were completely committed to free love, somewhat dangerously for us women, without easy access to contraception before marriage back then. So as I say, we didn't have futilitarianism thrust upon us by an entrenched neoliberal outlook, which was only to appear two decades later, really, forcing people into those pointless jobs to ensure the survival of an economic order and a way of judging themselves that has both normalized the evisceration and commercial outsourcing of all our welfare resources, while also creating a culture celebrating only individual achievement. For this is the neoliberal order that Neil writes about and rightly sees persisting even today, post COVID, perhaps even being further entrenched however erratically, and hence ensuring that sense of personal futilitarianism or pointlessness that per so many people see or like to suppress in their existence. So it's that neoliberal rationality that forces us into endless grooming, self-monitoring, self-help, simply to enhance our market value, which has little or no authentic value. We know this because as Neil again says, it says here, in our current futilitarian condition, people are working ever longer hours, yet often in utterly pointless jobs, perhaps in middle management, he suggests, surveying and monitoring everything in which, as the late David Graeber rightly labeled, we're in bullshit jobs, jobs which are completely removed from what makes life. Live, worth living. Meanwhile, Neil further notes <clears throat> uh, that these jobs exist in stark contrast with other jobs, which actually I don't think he says quite enough about, which are essential for maintaining a healthy society. And in fact, they are where jobs are mainly increasing today, um, not to mention to create a sustainable world. And these are the jobs which are evident in diverse forms of care work. But what distinguishes them, as we know, is that they are mostly very poorly paid, if paid at all, as well as the most insecure and precarious jobs. It's also true that these are the jobs that keep expanding in recent decades that are also hard to fill because they're so devalued and badly paid. So this is the essential work of social reproduction. That is all that enables human life and also production to continue that remains marginalized everywhere in our continuing neoliberal condition. It almost exists to marginalize them. Something which I wrote about together with others of you, as you've heard in the Care Manifesto, which came out a year ago, addressing the state of carelessness all around us and how to overcome it. Meanwhile, what is valued is so-called productive work often those bullshit jobs, but also often rather dangerously, the jobs 
that keep on interfering with exactly what we should be doing in maintaining a sustainable world, merely adding to the carbon emissions that the mindless promotion of GDP growth usually entails. Thus early on, Neil also quotes the degrowth theorists, Jason Hickel and Yorgos Kalis, to suggest that we must end the pursuit of growth itself if we are to have a sustainable future. A crucial um, <clears throat> argument, I think, again, needing much more development and um, agreeing uh, with um, uh, Yorgos, Carlos, and others that um, there actually is no genuine capitalist green growth, contrary to what Johnson and others would like us to believe. Hence, ending environmental destruction, Neil concludes, means ending capitalism. So this text on futilitarianism does have a clear goal, overcoming capitalism. It offers a rich and invigorating account then of the human condition of our continuing neoliberal pre present, plus more than enough reasons to try and end its insecure, damaging futilitarian outcomes. Neil is also persuasive in insisting that the ongoing attacks on the humanities have occurred pr pr primarily because it can help us understand, because they can help us understand the state we're in. They can give us a richer language for expressing the injustice of our current conditions. And uh, here he quotes Will, who's also written on this, pointing out that hiking humanities fees can ensure that arts and culture are redirected to the realms of the elite, no longer threatened by all that cultural critique from the 1960s onwards, often successfully <coughs> redirected for subversive uses, highlighting the voices and the concerns of the hitherto silenced of the marginalized. But instead, students today <coughs> are directed, even forced, to choose their courses only in relation to market outcomes, vocational endeavors with suitable salaries, and denied the tools to help critique the existing order of things, or of course, simply to relish education for its own crucial sake. After this compelling diagnosis, however, we have to wait till the final 10 pages to find any pathway out of this futilitarian condition. So in that very short final chapter, we find the hope that you're uniting around our shared experience of futility, whether in states of precarity, performing useful work or underpaid essential work, needing more emphasis, um, we must step, we must <coughs> make the first step towards building a necessary movement for abolishing capitalist power. Well, perhaps, but tactics and strategies do not dare wave their utilitarian arm in this text. Hence, we find no real discussion of movements and their often divisive and conflictual histories, nor of the frequent futilities of oppositional party politics. I find my thoughts then returning to my own futilitarian past. There must be some way out of here. We listened to Bob Crooning in 1967. Back then, Dylan's Joker says to the thief, but there's too much confusion. I can't get no relief to which the thief kindly replies. There are many here amongst us who feel that life is but a joke. Oh dear, well, that's really what we thought then. Endless futilitarianism with little unity against it back in the 1960s. For as I've said, we Sydney libertarians, futilitarians were very clear what we opposed. Um, <clears throat> and this was, of course, before the success of the right with its neoliberal policies and rationalities. So what we opposed was the whole repressive institutional apparatus designed to protect us, policemen, priests, moralists, and authoritarians of all sorts. <clears throat> Actually, it's hoping to return to a belief, belief in those institutions that lies behind the current cultural wars today. Very important. I think. Above all, though, we were suspicious of the state and everything relating to it. Thus, my first arrest 
you could say, as a dedicated futilitarian, was when we were caught fly posting placards telling everybody not to vote. For voting was compulsory in Australia. So our placards read, whoever you vote for, the government gets in, illustrated by three little pigs in bowler hats. Quite arresting. And when there was a referendum, I can't remember on what we produced another colorful way of filling out the yes, no ballot saying, yes, we have no bananas, which of course might be a, a good summary for the outcome of those who voted leave in the EU referendum. Now, I no longer agree with my young anarchist self and I've always voted in the UK, especially since it's not compulsory uh, well, I never voted in Australia. Yet right now, I too can find it hard to see a clear way out of our current market-obsessed, misery-inducing, precarious present uh, with its zero-hours contracts and overall carelessness towards others. So... <clears throat> Uh, this is perhaps all the more so now while remaining in the Labour Party with its current leader, who tragically, unlike his predecessor, um, who everybody loved to attack, seemed to remain committed to, does remain committed to upholding the ruling economic order. I do see limited movement at some local levels trying to install forms of municipal socialism as in Preston imitated in Islington and other councils, although with such limited powers, but still trying to support cooperative worker run enterprises and recently in my area Islington opening a library of things where we can borrow not just books but tools or toys. That is anti-futilitarian, I'd say, as are all the mutual aid practices trying to extend well beyond the servicing of food banks, helping refugees and so on. <clears throat> now, in this um, <clears throat> book's final chapter, Neil also tries to highlight, does highlight other ways out of here. Like Will, our chair, he points, as I've said, to the significance of the humanities and social sciences, in understanding the cultural wars of the moment, designed, designed to strengthen an unpatriotic, unquestioning traditionalist right, actually growing and very dangerous, um, <clears throat> because as Will says, the humanities are seen as the enemy within a segment of the liberal elite that lacks national loyalty, especially in the wake of Black Lives Matter and its inspiration for promoting movements of anti-colonial, anti-racist critiques of capitalism. Neil also turns to the writing of Isabel Laurie, who suggests that resistance begins from understanding our social re relationality, or as Butler asserts, and we describe in our care manifesto, recognizing our shared vulner vulnerability while rigorously rejecting the futility of the individualistic, competitive, neoliberal rationality. But surely here we have also to appreciate the rise of white, that white nationalist authoritarian political formations also mobilized by anger, people being mobilized by anger at seeing themselves economically abandoned in neoliberal shifts and eager to blame all the wrong people. So <clears throat> this is um, the opposition that we have to be fighting at the same time as fighting for what Neil hopes to see, which is a new commons, a commons created by a common thread that connects us all, but is defined by all that we oppose from austerity and financialization to militarism or neglect of asylum seekers and climate change. So, I'd of course like to see a little more grounding for this becoming common rather than the resistance of the right um, and of all that might bring us together in trying to overturn corporate capitalism for the sake of the common good. I think I saw hopes of this, for instance, at the World Transformed six weeks ago, where indeed I last saw Kia, but perhaps I'll hear a little more about it today. So I really welcome this book. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Lynn. Uh, that was terrific. And uh, some fascinating glimpses into the genealogy of futilitarianism and confessions of youthful futilitarian behaviour, uh, which has uh, cast this into a, into a different kind of light to do the extent to which some of these forces are on, on the left as well as on the right. Um, I'd like to now turn to William Callison. Um, William is a political theorist and a member in the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in uh, Princeton, New Jersey, I believe. He is co-editor of Mutant Neoliberalism, uh, which is a, a terrific volume on some of the recent uh, authoritarian and populist and nationalist uh, turn within uh, neoliberal politics uh, of Near, Near Futures Online and Rethinking Sovereignty and Capitalism. And he is currently writing a book about haywire liberalism and Far right politics. Uh, so uh, we are zipping over now to um, New Jersey. William, are you are you with us? I can't. I am. You <laughs> are great. Hi. Yeah. Hello. Um, so I'm very excited to to be here um, in such great company and to follow on uh, Lynn and Kier uh, to discuss Neil's new book, which is not just a panoramic reading of the present, but also an engrossing read. The book is kind of at the end, I was thinking about what, what I found kind of most admirable about the book. And it's really a model for theorists like myself who uh, wish to map and to interrogate different political, economic, cultural logics across multiple spheres of life. And the real novelty in the book for me lies in its readings of so-called micro-political phenomena. So, affect, desire, subjective experience, and in the connections it draws between them and macro-political systems. So systems which simultaneously, Neil argues, thrive on micro-political activities of individuals and thwart any progress that individuals can make at that register. Another uncommon and compelling feature of this book and why I call it an engrossing read is the levity with which it uh, navigates subjects that are often quite bleak, which is to say, uh, Neil, in case you were wondering, at least one of your readers really loved the jokes in the book, both noticed the jokes and, and, and enjoyed them. Uh, so beginning with, and really in the spirit of Marx's famous punchline or punchlines about Jeremy Bentham, Neil delivers a litany of tasteful takedowns directed at Obama, Blair, Pinker, several politicians in New Zealand, Fox News host Steve Hilton, among many others. And I was going to open with a couple of the jokes, but then I realized I would run out of time. So you'll just have to read the book to get the jokes your, yourself. So to open my remarks, um, what, I'm, what I'm going to do first is just offer a few, not really more than a few words. Um, uh, some thoughts about the general argument of the book, and then I'm going to turn to a very specific question about the, um, the ambivalent politics of futility and its relationship to nihilism. So cheery, cheery topics to come. But first, let me begin with the, this excellent title and the concept of the book, Futilitarianism. What is futilitarianism? Well, let me offer an example. Futilitarianism registers the feeling I had last week when I read an email from my alma mater sent to grad students with a subject line, I kid you not, and I quote, a beginner's guide to investing in stock. After opening the email, I found the first section, which is called student well-being, under which it says, and I again, I'll quote, Ask the finance expert, what advice do you have for students who are interested in investing in stocks? Beneath that, I found another image and link with the title, Keto, Paleo, and Counting Your Macros, The Promises and Problems of Trending Diets. The mental health crisis on campus is so dire, this university administration suggests, that students really should get to managing their portfolios and fine tuning their diets. This corresponds to Neil's general discussion of uh, futilitarianism. In the first chapter, he examines the historical relationship between utilitarianism and capitalism, which fused the principle of utility maximization, so the pursuit of uh, happiness and the production of overall happiness, into the project of 
capital accumulation. Here, Neil argues that the logic of utility has, what he, has, he uses this word quite often, flipped. Utility has flipped into one of futility with the rise of neoliberalism and related forms of social, political, and economic individualism within it. From the outset of neoliberalism into its contemporary mutations, Neil explains, and I quote, Existential futility is the logical outcome of the historical relationship between utilitarianism and capitalism, end quote. What Neil explores then is a condition of deepening entrapment of individuals, both despite and because of their attempt to improve their own conditions, which is to say, we inhabit a system in which, as we pursue individual and often also collective goals, we become less happy, more anxious, more indebted and more exploitable. So this is utilitarianism in some admirers, and now I'm thinking about it a little bit differently with Lynn's talk just now about uh, attachments to utilitarianism, but we could say it's utilitarianism, uh, the admirer's utilitarianism turned on its head because it's not yielding greater happiness uh, in this form, uh, quite the opposite. Unsurprising, one of the sites Neil discusses is the contemporary university and the explosion of adjunctification, supposedly on the basis of cost-benefit analysis, as we're all very familiar with. Drawing on post-structural thinkers, Neil also examines social media and digital communication more generally, which run on the proliferation of information engagement, but again, undercut our capacity, or well, in this case, undercut our capacity to use language to make meaning which results in, as Kier also uh, mentioned, what he calls semiotic indigestion, a lot of uh, very colorful metaphors here. In this and many other sites, Neil explores how self-help, self-marketing, self-branding become both imperatives uh, of, they're imperatives of both self-improvement, but also entrapment. And more broadly, he discusses the need to self-brand and how this leads to paranoia, and how the injunction of responsibility leads to anxiety. He writes, and here I quote, a world of self-brands can only produce an illusory community, which is brought together by a sense of shared paranoia. The community of self-brands is characterized by the need, by need and distrust. The need for others to buy into the brand and the distrust that others have and will continue to have whether and if they buy into the brand. Beyond this, why does self-branding and the self-branding of human capital lead to feelings of inadequacy, despair, despair, and futility? Well, one of the key mechanisms that Neil discusses or, and, and mentions in passing as well is internalization. For example, anger is turned inward and is translated into anxiety which on a psychoanalytic level is also a psychic defense against this external world of extreme precarity. This analysis that, that Neil offers, and I'll talk a little bit about internalization in, in a second again, but this yields what I think Neil calls a futilitarian paradox, or he talks at least about a paradox. Our age seems to be defined by an intractable paradox, Neil writes, and I quote, Taking on greater responsibility is ultimately useless in ensuring individual, collective, or environmental well being. The reason for this paradox is not that responsibility is pointless, but that the kind of responsibility we are encouraged and, in many instances, forced to take is one that places the entire burden of systemic problems on us as individuals. This problem is also presented in the form of a question as a kind of riddle which Neil quotes from a 1981 speech from none other than President Ronald Reagan. And I quote, if, if no one among us is capable of governing himself, then who among us has the capacity to govern someone else? End quote. What strikes me about Neil's discussion of this Reaganite riddle is that we are confronted with a kind of deep internalization or even a kind of psychic twist on what political scientists call collective action problems. Whereas collective action problems refer to cases where individuals are better off cooperating it fail to do so because of conflicting interests. The futilitarian paradox or the futilitarian collective action problem or action problem refers to how subjects 
can pursue their happiness and even certain kinds of political projects. And yet the larger systems already in place work against the possibility of achieving this happiness or achieving these goals. In turn, this is quite devastating for the goal of transformative and emancipatory politics. Now the book concludes as, as Lynn was just discussing by taking us from futilitarian entrapment to a more hopeful reflection on what Neil calls becoming common, which is to say the prospects for collective political action. But what I'm gonna do in the last little bit of my comment right now is to do is, is something else instead. And I'm gonna talk about a much more ambivalent uh, place and part of the book, which is nihilism. Neil discusses this question, but I think it could be a very generative uh, kind of area for further inquiry beyond the book. Indeed, I would argue that Neil's book opens up a kind of Pandora's box, precisely because his concept and his, you, uh, his concept and his analysis of futility is so useful, I'm using the word useful with a wink, uh, for critical theory, for critical inquiry. Um, uh, I think that it kind of, there, there are certain parts of the book which might kind of spill out uh, beyond what we can even get or expect within this single book which is to say the book offers a powerful heuristic for interpreting our political present, including some of the things I've been thinking and writing about recently, like the surge of conspiracy theories used in both self-branding, self-marketing, but also in electoral campaigns of political parties, of individual politicians. And here I wish I had a little bit more time that I gave myself more time because I would also like to pick up on some of the things that Kier was discussing with respect to political subjectivity, because I'm about to take us to a set of questions about political subjectivity. And I really uh, liked where Kier took us, though it was quite a different place. And I, I, think that, I think that each of the forms, I would say each of the forms, I'm not sure whether, what, how I'd specify the residual and the emergent, though I have many thoughts on that, but I think that they're kind of, I, at least for me now in thinking about what I'm about to talk about, they're looming large. They're kind of in the background here, but maybe something to talk about later. Okay, so on to nihilism. So we know what Neil means by futility. What about nihilism? Well, he defines the term. Well, first he says a nihilistic outlook has been developing throughout the, neo, the neoliberal decades. And to define the term, he draws on uh, Simon Critchley's distinction between passive nihilism and active nihilism. Whereas the passive nihilist, quote, looks at the world from a certain distance, finds it meaningless, closes his eyes and makes himself into an island, according to Critchley, the active nihilist also finds everything meaningless, but instead of sitting back and contemplating, he tries to destroy this world and bring another into being, end quote. The result is, according to Neil, a world split between extreme inertia and spectacular violence, between the mindfulness guru and the terrorist. Futility is different than nihilism, however, he argues, as the concept of futility makes room for another dimension in the meaninglessness of neoliberal life, quote, where nihilism entails taking up a certain outlook on the world, futility is much more insidious and internalized. Futility is thus a form of entrapment in the pursuit of meaningless, uh, in, the, in the pursuit of meaningfulness, where we are forced to repeat daily behaviors that ensnare us deeper into the pure logic of competition and individualism. Neil goes on to say, by focusing on futility rather than nihilism, we can see not only how the experience of meaninglessness that comes with neoliberalism, we can not only see this experience, but we can also see the construction of that meaninglessness in contemporary social and political practices. And this is what Neil takes the book to do. I think it does. And I think that Neil is right here, but what I'd like to kind of open up from this, this space or this question, this distinction is, um, and, and really what I'd like to kind of ask Neil to perhaps think about in his response or to ask the panelists whether they have any thoughts about this um, themselves, is the distinction between futility and nihilism, but also 
the different sites and insights that we might get when we kind of zero in on one or the other in our analysis of, of everyday life or of, or of the political present. Consider a couple sites here, I'm moving towards wrapping up that say an analysis of futility or my, of uh, nihilism might take us. One subjective response to futility, for example, might be unionizing your workplace or going on strike, say against Kellogg's or John Deere, as has happened recently. Another response might be to blame yourself or to blame or even harm others, especially what we would say the wrong kinds of others, say immigrants or trans people. Here, to go darker, we might also consider the question of violence. Active nihilism, we just heard, yields a kind of violence that includes very off-sighted examples like incels who act out by murdering women, or so-called incels, but there are some famous instances where we've had these, these murders, or instances of far-right or racist terror. But I'd like to ask, as a kind of as a form of distinction, as a form of kind of thinking with Neil as well, what about a psychosocial analysis of futility and its relationship to violence? We might consider cases where individuals, mostly men, act out violently against loved ones who did not cause their futility in domestic violence or femicide. Such examples, which are omnipresent but hardly ever discussed, might explain how futility, how the futility of neoliberal capitalism is enjoined with patriarchy. In the US alone, three women are murdered per day, 92% of the cases by a man they knew. In Mexico, 10 women are murdered a day. And this week there are massive protests, feminist protests in Mexico City against this epidemic of femicides. While Neil's book explores what he calls the relationship between political desire and the practice of politics. And he suggests that, quote, the pandemic has accentuated the simultaneous decline of political de deliberation and the increase of political desire in the wider populace. I'd like to suggest that there are examples, that the examples Neil discusses are just the beginning of where an analysis and a critique of, of, futil of futility and of nihilism uh, might go and indeed using the tools that he offers us. As I mentioned before, I think that the distinction between utility and nihilism might also help us understand particularly- William, sorry to interrupt, but we're just gonna, we're just gonna try and wrap things up fairly quickly, just so I'm conscious yeah, of, two more of the time. No problem, two more okay. <laughs> um, uh, Between futility and nihilism is what I was talking about this distinction, uh, to understand particular forms of politics and political subjectivities that have really blossomed under the pandemic, including conspiracy movements. So in closing, what I'd like to suggest is that while Neo does not elaborate on this method himself, the book is really a kind of uh, artful psychoanalytic critique in the best sense of the word. It both works toward naming and working through our symptom with analytic precision, philosophical openness and levity, and it shows us how naming and working through this symptom, futility and perhaps also nihilism, can help us work collectively against the systems that have rendered so many of our activities futile today. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, William, and uh, apologies for interrupting. Okay. Uh, There's fascinating uh, observations and uh, opportunities to take this discussion um, to some um, fairly kind of murky and, and terrifying areas, but I think those are definitely themes that I, felt in the book as well. So um, I, I think those are some very interesting uh, provocations there. Um, I'm going to now ask Neil um, <laughs> to uh, respond to some of these ideas. Let me just briefly introduce Neil, who's, uh, for those of you who don't uh, know Neil, he's a political and social theorist based at the University of Otago in New Zealand. His work has appeared in journals including Rethinking Marxism and uh, Poetics Today, and he's written for political magazines including The New Internationalist and Raw. And uh, good news uh, for Neil, his life is becoming uh, less um, futilitarian, at least uh, professionally, in that he has just uh, won a two-year Rutherford Foundation uh, postdoctoral fellowship at Otago to work on a history of neoliberalism and migrant detention. Um, so Neil, um, uh, I'm going to ask you to perform a, a rather impossible task now uh, to yeah. respond to some of what you've heard, which covers obviously a huge range of areas, but um, perhaps you'd like to 
uh, come back and say a bit about the book and, and, and respond to some of the, the, the topics that have been raised. Um, thanks so much, Will. And um, I just am um, really um, touched and moved by, by the words of, of um, Care, uh, Lynn and, and William. Um, um, Bob, each of the, the speakers have shaped the book in, in many ways. Um, I read William's recent neoliberalism, which he co-edited with Zachary Manfredi, at a really crucial stage in the book, and it completely transformed the way that I was thinking about neoliberalism. Um, Kerr's work, as he kind of intimated towards in, in his discussion, um, he is talking about the generation that this book is kind of emerging from. Um, and I think Care's work, um, anyone out there who knows it will know how, how important his book Generation Left has been um, for just kind of thinking about how we mobilize in the future on, on a political level. And then Lynn's work, um, in particular coming across kind of radical happiness, her book Radical Happiness, and, and this, um, and particularly, uh, hopefully I might get a chance to talk a little bit about um, care work and the idea of social reproduction but this idea of, of re the really the relationship between individual pursuits of happiness and the idea that actually happiness can only, only come about um, in relation with others, um, can only emerge from our kind of collective endeavors. And often these endeavors take place outside of, of capitalism. Um, so hopefully, I'm actually just gonna take the time um, to thank a few people quickly. Um, and then hopefully um, afterwards in the Q and A, we can I can get a, we can have a bit of more of a chance to respond to some of the things that have come up and, and maybe push a bit further um, from what um, Care William and, and Lynn have discussed. Um, but it's it's also I I'm obviously based in Dunedin, New Zealand, and it, it sometimes um, and this is in it's in the deep south of um, of New Zealand, the South Island of New Zealand. So sometimes it's hard not to feel like you're at the end of the world here. So it's really great to, to be able to have these discussions with um, some of the kind of people I see at the forefront of kind of critical scholarship at the moment. Actually, there's a legend that has it um, quick aside in um, a city, uh, uh, just the furthest south city in Dunedin, Invercargill, um, or sorry, in New Zealand, it's Invercargill, which is the only other city further south than Dunedin. And there's a legend that has it that um, it's either Mick Jagger or Keith Richards, um, that no one has kind of settled on who said it, but they described Invercargill as the arsehole of the world. Um, so it's really great to be able to talk to you from somewhere near the arsehole of the world. Um, I've really got to thank Will and um, Will Davies here, as many of you will know. Um, um, First of all, for embracing this book project when I, when I first brought the proposal to him and really seeing potential in this idea of utilitarianism and really pushing me towards developing the, the, the kind of theoretical foundations of, of the idea. Um, I've long admired Will's work, which was one of the main reasons why I approached Goldsmith's Press and the Perk series. Um, and, and any of you who are familiar with Will's work out there will probably see how, um, how his work has kind of shaped my, my own thinking. Um, and I also want to thank the peer reviewers of the of the manuscript. Um, I think I saw Dave Clark in the audience there somewhere, who is one of the peer reviewers who was really has really helpful suggestions um, on on the book and, and really kind words about the book was really uh, reassuring and gave me a lot of confidence. And I'm really fortunate to have amazing endorsements on the book from some scholars at whose work I just adore, um, particularly Wendy Brown who. I mean, has been mentioned already and is probably the kind of foremost scholar of neoliberalism in the world. Um, and Jessica White, who I'm not sure she is out there in the audience, but um, I sent her to put manuscript and I was extremely nervous about her reading it because I was currently teaching her book at that time. Um, and I think actually her book, which I urge all of you to read, called Morals of the Market, um, is, is probably one of my favorite books I've ever read. Um, so I was really delighted when she came back and. Um, um, enjoyed enjoyed my text. Um, and Adam Kotzko and Richard Seymour as well wrote really generous blurbs and I, I really thank them for that. And the Goldsmiths Press team have been remarkable. Um, Susan Kelly, um, who was the editorial production manager. Um, I think we bonded because she was from Dunedin. Um, so um, 
And uh, she just, the work she put into the book was just phenomenal. And I, I really am eternally grateful for that. And the rest of the staff at Goldsmiths Press have been excellent. They're really, really great um, press. And we really need more radical university presses that are kind of public facing. Um, as many of the other big university press turn inwards or away from kind of public. So I urge you to support Goldsmiths Press as much as you can. So the book itself emerged from several places. Um, but I think that the early genesis of the book emerged from an extensive wave of job cuts in the humanities division at the University of Otago, where I'm based. And we've already touched, the speakers already touched a bit on the role of the humanities in, in my work. And the situation of, of the, uh, the kind of campaign against humanities, for many of you out there who might be in universities will be very uh, familiar. Um, and it was then I started thinking about the relationship between the humanities and, and futility, um, asking why, why have the humanities come to be deemed so useless? And here I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about defending that uselessness as some others have, of, of um, in effect defending the right to study disciplines within humanities. I feel like that's kind of self-evident. Um, but rather thinking about how things like the humanities come to be understood as useless, how that uselessness is tied up in wider social, political, and cultural trends. And how the humanities have come, to quote Will Davies on it, the enemy within. Um, I believe this isn't a coincidence. It's deeply tied in, in the kind of functionality of the world as it stands. And then the more I started to study this, this relationship, the more I realized that this concept of futility extended across um, kind of contemporary life and contemporary society. And that actually is, is quite central to neoliberalism's hold over us. And that's been really encouraging to hear Kerr, um, Lynn and, and William kind of tease out some of the ways that futility manifests um, in our contemporary life. It's kind of very much what the aim of the book was. Because everywhere around us, so many people are endlessly working, often in precarious situations, getting into debt to get a degree and, and learn a skill, um, trying to make themselves as useful as possible in order to try and secure some sense of individual survival in this kind of maelstrom. Um, and yet it seems like all these attempts at maximizing utility don't seem to have made the majority of us, majority of us feel happier um, as the utilitarian philosophers have told us would happen. In fact, it seems like the actual act of maximizing utility has led to the greatest unhappiness of the greatest number under, and especially I think Kerr makes a really important point about post 2008, the shift in neoliberalism, which is why William's book, Mutant Neoliberalism is so important. Um, this idea that um, the way that neoliberalism evolves, uh, shifts to the kind of wider economic social trends. Um, and, and yeah, certainly there's um, Pierre Dardot and um, Christian Laval um, just define the kind of post 2008 neoliberalism as, as a war against the population. And we see that in kind of austerity policies and so on and so forth. Um, and the book is aimed at the generation that care. Um, Ten points in his book, Generation Left, as he said, I see it as a kind of anthem or requiem for, for a, doomed, a doomed youth. Um, and so this is what the concept of utilitarianism is, is really trying to name. And I hope some people can find use, um, pardon the pun on that, and some use um, in the book. Um, and it's been really exciting to see the way that William, Kerr and Lynn have, have used ideas in the book to think through their own kind of um, uh, political thinking. And the idea of utilitarianism is kind of wrapped up in my own story, um, especially since finishing my PhD in 2015. I've been working on a series of, kind of casual contracts within the university that take up so much time, are terribly paid, and have no provisions for research. So any writing and thinking I did for this book was all done on my own, my own time. And the real big breakthrough for the book came when my partner um, Lindley, um, uh, she was awarded the writer in residence position at University of Canterbury in, in Christchurch, New Zealand. Um, and this enabled me to take a six month break from teaching. And that's when I really broke the back of the book. So without Lindley getting that position, I don't think I would have been able to write the book. Um, and then when we came back to Dunedin in early 2019, I decided not to teach and instead um, find a job where I could 
just go to the office, do the job and not have to think about it outside and spend the rest of the time trying to finish off the book. Um, so I ended up getting a job writing death notices and classified adverts for the local newspaper in Dunedin, the Otago Daily Times, um, which I'm sure is where many of you get your, your hot news from. Um, in fact, I think it was um, the day after Trump was elected, um, which I think was probably quite a major global story. The headline, the front page of the ODT was um, New Zealand Cafe wins best sausage roll in New Zealand. Um, so, <laughs> I, um, so the irony of spending my days writing classified ads at ODT while writing a book called Utilitarianism, right, it's not lost on me. But at the same time, that, that job did enable me to finish the book. So um, I am grateful for it on some level. Um, and obviously now, as Will said, with um, the Rutherford Foundation Postdoctoral Fellowship, I'll actually have a couple of years to, to, to do research and write. And hopefully the next book, if, if there is a next book, um, might be written in slightly more conventional certain senses. And of course, with any book, um, it's not only the author's ideas um, that are in here, and each page bears the imprints of, of many conversations I've had with friends and colleagues. And I can't name them all here, um, um, but you all know who you are. I can see you out there. Um, um, but in particular, I'd really like to thank my PhD supervisor, Lynn Tribble, um, who's been a great inspiration for me um, and is one of, um, one of one of the most kaleidoscopic minds I've ever come across um, and such a great support over the years. Um, and my friendships with um, people like Catherine Deal, Sonia Mitchell, Rianne Gallagher, um, Mark Seymour, who I see on, out there, who's been a kind of head of history at Otago and a real mentor for me in recent years, and Simone Drickle out there, whose work, I think, Lynn talked about this idea of um, shared vulnerability and, and Simone's work um, on relationality um, and, and vulnerability, I think, is some of the most exciting research um, I've ever come across. And she um, has been a real deep inspiration for me uh, and my work. Um, the book is dedicated to the memory of my mum and grandmother, um, who died within a one, uh, month, one month of one another at the end of 2015. Um, those who knew, know me will know how much they each shaped my life. Um, and while their loss is still immense, their presence is, is felt in my life um, every day. Um, my family in, in Ireland and in the UK, I see some of them out there. My dad and stepmom, my two sisters, Lisa and Nikki, and my niece, Ellie. Um, um, and my, my uncle, Trevor and Barbara, and my cousin, Catherine. Um, they've always been so supportive and I feel so lucky to have them. Um, and my partner's family, Stuart and Carol, who are here in the house. Um, and Meg and Mike and the, the twins in Wellington, Darling Grant, Max and Emily in Sydney have been so welcoming to me here in New Zealand and have really enabled me to feel like New Zealand is my home. And they're really truly special people and I, I feel so indebted to them. And then of course, the final, the biggest debt of gratitude goes to my partner, Lindley, who some of you out there will know is a renowned poet and essayist in New Zealand. Um, and in many ways, she is kind of co-author of this book because so much of the kind of conversations and the ideas that were formed in the book came from, from long conversations with her. Um, and she also remains steadfast in her belief that in the book, um, especially at times when I thought, why the hell am I writing this thing? Um, I'm writing death notices during the day and at night, writing um, political theory. Um, but her support really enabled the book to happen. And, and more than anything, she, she makes life worth living. And um, so none of this would have been possible without her. And then almost two years ago, um, it's actually his birthday. We're having his birthday party tomorrow. We, um, we added our son Malloy to, to the midst. Um, and actually he could probably be added as a co-author because I spent so much time reading with him strapped to my chest or lying on me asleep. And actually without those periods of stillness, I wouldn't have got so much of the reading done for the book. Um, and he is such a joy and he could not care less that I've written the book. And um, I, uh, love him for that. So I'm sorry I haven't actually directly engaged with Lynn Williams and a CARES book, but this is kind of the only opportunity I'll get to really thank those people. But I hopefully in a Q&A uh, over the next 10, 15 minutes, we can engage in some of those ideas. Um, but I think 
hopefully that means the book is launched and so please read it and buy it even if you just <laughs> use it to, to prop up a table that's still useful on some level um, so thank you very much that's terrific neil thanks so much for sharing um the the, the story of the book and the and the personal context which is always uh, absolutely crucial to any book and and it's 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 really lovely to hear uh, some of that context um I'm just, I, I've asked if anyone has any questions, they want to write them in the chat. Um, uh, and so far nobody has, but do just uh, jot anything, drop anything in there. Do specify if there was anything that anyone said, whether it be Neil or anybody else, uh, that you would like to uh, ask a question about. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we can take them there. Um, uh, so <laughs> there's uh, obviously lots of, lots of different things have been raised uh, about the, about the book um so <laughs> i'm now slightly busking it wondering what, what the kind of going on with the kind of q a but do you want to since it's kind of i guess one of the freshest things in in my own mind is there anything that, that you have to, to to say about about this question of nihilism since that was was where the previous uh contribution ended up and and, and obviously i mean uh, william took things towards some of the sort of darker violent edge of of some of what you described which is not just uh, affective but but um but but existential and and, and fatal potentially yeah, I think that I was really pleased that William um, picked up on that um, this, that relationship between utilitarianism and, and nihilism, because um, it's only a kind of short bit in the introduction. Um, but it was a relationship that I had been thinking about in context with the book for quite a while, because I was thinking, is am I basically just describing nihilism with the idea of utilitarianism? How is utilitarianism somehow different to nihilism? And how, I guess the question, I think Lynn even um, uh, kind of intimated towards this. I was, I was trying to think about how do we actually gain some, some hope out of, out of the situation? And so what I was trying to kind of do with the idea of utilitarianism is build a bridge between nihilism and kind of action, but uh, action that's positive and hopeful. Um, but um, as, as William kind of points out, um, and as other scholars have pointed out, you know, nihilism is, is a real kind of fundamental aspect of neoliberalism. Wendy Brown makes this point. Um, Mark Fisher, who, you know, his work, I imagine many of us is really influenced on the left. Um, he even described it as nihil nihiliberalism. <laughs> um, so there's a kind of sense that, that, that this idea of, of meaninglessness and is is really central to the to the condition that we find ourselves in at the moment, um, especially um, in the midst of the kind of COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, but I guess what I'm trying to do with the idea of utilitarianism is to show is to show that that this this feeling that often might we might name as nihilism, this idea of feeling hopelessness of 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 just feeling a sense of trying to constantly get ahead. And, and it's one of the great kind of paradox of neoliberalism is that it, it passes all responsibility and autonomy onto the individual. And at the same time, it dismantles all the kind of social collective structures that can allow you to even carry that responsibility. And that's really pinpointed in Lynn's work around care. Um, and this is something I'm working on with a colleague of mine, Anna Maria, Mertola, we're writing quite a bit about social reproduction and, and the essential worker. Um, but I think what, yeah, so I'm trying to get at this um, yeah, relationship between the individual and the collective. And I think what I, what I argue is that this feeling that we have, this sense of utility is not a defect of our individual characters as you know, the kind of emails that Will, William was reading out from the university, even the university is trying to tell the students, this is all your responsibility. It's not a defect of our individual characters, but actually an effect of this kind of social economic system that we live in. And actually one of the fears, um, as, as William pointed out, is that anger gets, there's no expression for anger, it gets turned inwards. Um, you mentioned this, Will, um, in your book, Happiness Industry, as well, that this kind of self-help industry is about critique turned inwards. And I guess with utilitarianism, I'm trying to turn that critique outwards. I'm trying to get us to dispel that anger away from us 
in a way that does not end up in nihilism, in a way that might actually generate some sort of collective hope um, together and working together. Neil, and, and um, I mean, there's actually a question um, from Anna Maria Mottola oh. in the chat, which is, uh, might the great resignation indicate something of a shift here, which uh, is refers to the, uh, the great resignation, this is, this is a, the, the people quitting their jobs, right? Is this, and, and yeah. the kind of, the, the, the sort of, um, the massive tightening of labor markets uh, around the world. Um, it's great, and um, thanks, Anna Maria, for asking me a really hard question at my um, book launch. Someone who I write with, um, so I'll remember that um, the next time that we're working together. Um, yeah, I guess so. Um, I, I think Care, Lynn, and William actually would have some really, and um, Will yourself would probably have some really good thoughts on that. Um, Care, perhaps as um, as a former academic, um, I think. Uh, a, a, a great resignation from the university um, seems like quite a hopeful um, endeavour. I think Lynn has something to say on this. Lynn, you have your hand up. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, um, I'm one of the incredibly lucky people who was able to resign at the end of last year. And there are very many of us, women of a certain age, no, sorry, people of a certain age who uh, suddenly got, wow. Now is the time to resign. <laughs> and uh, I've actually written about 50 years in academia and the incredible changes that, um, that I lived through and just how crucial the 70s and even into the 80s were in um, empowering people to engage politically. I mean, that's when all sorts of movement politics took off linked to community struggles and so on. And um, I think that goes on well into the 90s, actually, that although neoliberalism is emerging in many fronts, you know, the universities remain a site of resistance and just getting into the university means that you're likely to be finding a voice and finding a way to resist. So I, I do think that um, uh, your argument and, and, and Will's argument about um, the attack on humanities is incredibly important and that trying to fight that and turn that around is, is essential to um, us um, resisting uh, futilitarianism and finding ways to uh, fight capitalism at present. Keir's got his hand up. Yeah, sorry, there's some questions in the chat now. So, <laughs> but I just wanted to, uh, uh, to to address this idea of the Great Resignation because, you know, part of what part of what's going on is that um, is people are sort of <laughs> are not taking shit jobs or uh, are demanding higher wages for shit jobs, and uh, and basically people are sort of it's, it's as though the the sort of like the pause of COVID, but in particular the sort of the the sort of temporary welfare state of COVID has allowed people to sort of like have a little bit of time out almost like a little bit of um, digestion time for um for you know that that pause from that like dramatic uh, um uh, constant overwork uh, to have a little pause and think about well what's life about do you know what i mean um and i think I, we should probably take seriously that that little bit about the sort of temporary mini welfare state it's a bit of a it's a bit of a sort of US phenomenon in particular because everyone got their $1,400 checks, et cetera, which allowed them to say, well, well great, I'm not going to work then. Um, but I also wanted to just, just, just to come to, to, to what you were saying, Neil, in response to, to William's idea about, you know, um, about nihilism and like, you know, perhaps the ways in which, all right, put it this way, the ways in which anti-futilitarianism might take on a right-wing um, aspect for instance, I'm thinking in particular about the conspiracy theories that that William was was um, uh, was was pointing to. So we could take the best one, <laughs> the not quite the ear one. I think it is the ear conspiracy theory these days, which is QAnon. Um, you know, part of what QAnon gives to people is, you know, you get uh, you get meaning in life. It's a meaning that you have to contribute to. Um, and you also get a little bit of an enchanted life. Your life becomes a little bit enchanted. Uh, because you know you're um, you're you're suddenly doing something which is of world historic importance. The point, of course, right, is it is still futile because actually you're doing absolutely nothing and you're interpreting things which are meaningless, right? Um, but but that's the danger is that like you know the way you can understand something like QAnon is these are self 
these are self-produced um, mysteries, right, which can act as a distraction from the real difficult problem. I, I was talking about this the other day where I re-watched re Memento, the film Memento, and I'm going to do spoilers on Memento, so everybody turn off if you haven't heard them. But so Memento is when the guy's lost his memory, he can't remember what he's doing, and he's, 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 he's trying to track down, he's got this mystery, he's trying to track down the person who killed his wife. And then as the film goes on, you realise, in fact, he killed his wife by accident and he's invented this mystery because he can't bear the actual horrific truth that he's killed his wife. That's what QAnon is. Invent a mystery which is which is much nicer and easier to solve than the horror of, of climate change, basically. Something which is done by a small group of people, therefore a small group of people can be the response to it. So you still have the you still have the response to futility. You escape futility or you appear to escape futility. Um, and it's much easier to escape futility into this imaginary, to address this imaginary problem than the real one, which is much more difficult. Just an observation. I don't know how we get, <laughs> what we do about that. Thanks, Keir. Um, I want to um, uh, just, there's a couple of comments in the chat that people have probably seen. One from Rene Sheehan saying, how might the ecological crisis shift this dominant capitalist agenda? And then I think partly a, a possibly a response to that from Amanda Barouche. Yeah. Um, doesn't climate change reinforce the sense of futility? I hear there's a movement that suggests the only answer to this is collective grieving, which sounds a little bit like the Dark Mountain project. Uh, maybe that's unfair to them, I'm not sure. But there are these, these, these projects of that nature. Um, I, I think probably it's best that we come back to, to, to Neil on this because yeah. climate change and, and eco-collapse are features of your book. Uh, you talk particularly about boycotts as a kind of futile um, strategy for, for sort of expressing one's own sort of powerlessness almost. And then also um, antenatal um, movements, which seek to kind of, you know, take on um, uh, the, 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 the population control and so on. Um, could you just talk a little bit briefly about, I mean, we're running out of time slightly, but what, what is yeah. the place of ecological crisis in your in your thesis and, and, and what you would say yeah. to these two comments? Yeah, I'll, and I'll, I'll deal with it quickly. And I think it builds actually on, on Kerr's point um, about um, a kind of anti futilitarianism that actually can be, um, uh, yeah, a, a project of, of say the new right of, of the kind of far far right. And I think, I think the danger, and I maybe don't hide this enough in the book. I think the danger is it's precisely because of futility that that things like human non exist. Um, but it's also because we have absolutely no kind of. It's because we encounter these solely as individuals that we end up in these kind of, um, uh, yeah, as conspiracies are easier than actually doing the hard work of, of collective action, um, I guess. Is easy. And so I think the important, what I'm really keen to do with utilitarianism is, is that this concept is not thought about on its own, that it is part of a wider anti-capitalist movement. And um, that futilitarianism, it, we don't just counter it on like, how can I make my life more meaningful? And I think this manifests in the way that, that we think about the climate change or, or the capacity we have at the moment to counter ecological collapse. Because this is, this is, the, this is our time, like, this is the, the, the problem of our era, essentially, of our age, of, of humanity, uh, effectively. Um, and all the, none of the tools that we have to counter this are, are are in place. Um, so I talk a bit in the book about boycotting, um, which is, um, some of you may not have heard of that, but it's a kind of micro political action that um, instead of boycotting, which entails not buying a product or whatever, um, boycotting is that you you buy another product that's, that's in competition with the product that you're boycotting. So what it allows us to do is feel like we're being ethical the same, at one time, but also consuming at the same time. <laughs> Um, I talk about the anti natalist movement, the idea that we should all stop having children, um, which really doesn't take in any kind of differences between the way that global north countries kind of eat carbon, carbon resources and global south countries don't. Um, but I guess the one I'm really trying to get at there is that the, the, the very collective subject, and this is the point Mark Fisher made in Capitalist Realism, the very collective subject that the, the only collective subject that can counter um, ecological crisis um, is the kind of collective anti-capitalist subject does not exist in under neoliberalism, does not exist under futilitarianism. And so the job 
of us. And this is what I want to get at with it becoming common. And I see that conclusion to the book as a kind of uh, a kind of starting point for something further to think about is that it is only in our kind of relational ties and our kind of collective um, endeavors that we can actually build something that might counter ecological and um, ecological crisis. As obviously I'm talking here about a common common that is anti-capitalist, but that is our only hope. Um, otherwise, futili futility is our future. Futility is ultimately the kind of, will be the history of humanity. Um, I don't know if that quite answers the question, but um, but that's what I'm trying to kind of get at in the book with, with um, my uh, discussion of climate crisis. Great, thanks, Neil. Uh, and I think it's now is uh, time to draw things to a close. Um, I want to thank all the speakers, um, Keir Milburn, uh, Lynn Segal, William Callison, uh, and particularly Neil Vallely for um, joining us and uh, producing this terrific book. Uh, do buy yourselves a copy. It's a terrific read. And I think it provokes uh, so much thinking across a wide range of areas, as you've seen um, over the course of uh, this evening, this morning, this afternoon, depending on where the hell you are, uh, discussion. So um, uh, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we will be putting a video of this out uh, online for anyone, uh, any of your friends, colleagues who've missed it um, and continue to um, follow Perk's work at perk.org.uk. So thank you very much. Um, let me just say thank you to everyone. Thank you. Um, I really, really appreciate it.